Can I just say that hell can try to laugh you uh, out of the vision, but it'll never laugh you into it. But one thing is for sure, if you will by faith make that decision to put your hand to the plow, regardless of what anyone says or circumstances which are always evolving in life, you keep your focus on the vision that God has for you. It may take time, but it will surely come to pass if you will not back off. vision. Uh, there is a vision that God begins to drop into the spirit of men and women. If you say, well, I'm not sure yet what it is I'm called to do. Don't worry. Just wait. In time, you're going to understand that. Uh, you can be sure along the way there will be many things that you're called to do. Uh, if you are uh, a, a woman, you can be sure that there's, uh, in all probability, God wants you to be a mother and wants you to be a wife as well as a Christian uh, as, because those are uh, high plans and purposes that God made beginning in the Garden of Eden. You might become a professional person also in the world. But one thing's for sure, whatever you put your hand to, you should do it in faith and do it in the name of Jesus. Uh, understanding that there is more at work than just you. God has you tied to a plan. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Uh, if you're a, a man, if you're, uh, you can be sure that in the process of God bringing a spiritual revelation to you or a manifestation of the plan that he has for your life, there will be many things along the way that are in the plan. Uh, once again, I believe that you will develop into a powerful man of God, a great Christian living the, the life of faith continually, and God will be directing you along that way. The steps of the righteous are ordered of God. And those paths that we get in oftentimes will change. It seems like it takes some detours sometimes. It can, it can uh, seem, seemingly be stalled. But in the name of Jesus, if you continue to serve God and to press forward, uh, just look out. You can be sure you're going to fulfill the vision, the plan that God has for your life. If you'll continue to press, do not become discouraged about serving the Lord and fulfilling that dream that's on the inside of you. Somebody shout amen. amen. When I'm reading it in the scripture, uh, I notice there in Habakkuk that the, the Bible says that it takes time but it will surely come to pass. I believe you can see that in more than one way. Without a doubt, the plan of God for redemption uh, took time, but it surely has come to pass through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? It looked like it was going to be aborted along the way many different times. But thank God, God always had a plan to bring his vision to pass for his man, for mankind. By the same token, in our lives individually, God gives you a call and a plan. Without vision, the Bible says in Proverbs, without vision, people perish. One translation says without vision, uh, the word perish, it literally means to break rank. It means to run amok. Uh, it's, it, it carries the connotation of a, of, of a river that has banks along the side of it. And, and the water flows uh, all over. And as long as there are banks there, that water can flow and flow and flow. But any time it runs out of banks, that just becomes a swamp. It begins to go like this, and it begins to dissipate, and it becomes like a swamp. And that's exactly what that word means when the Scripture says, without vision, my people perish. It's very important for you and I to have that vision in our life, I also like to call it, in a, in a minute sense of the word, I like to call it goals. That we have some goals in life that we have. And then inside of these goals that we are, uh, uh, that we are uh, processing forward to obtain, there is a vision that God has for our life. And many of the goals and the mile markers that you pass in your life will help bring to pass that vision. Some of those mile markers do not look too pleasant at the time, but do not lose your faith. Do not let go of your confidence, the Bible says. Trust God and keep pressing. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. The, the, the one thing that the scripture never tells you about 
when it says there are times and seasons for all things, and it begins to name over a dozen of those times and seasons, and it begins to tell, until, it, until you begin to realize all of those are things that, are, uh, that have process to them. But there's one thing that's not mentioned when it talks about times and seasons for all things. There's nothing there that says there's a time to quit. There are no times to quit in the kingdom of God. You ought to clap your hands to the Lord right there and just praise the Lord. We are people that continue to press forward and refuse to let things, our people, uh, our spirits, or our own self stop the vision that God places on the inside of our life and our heart. Let me read to you a couple of scriptures this morning that, that to me are very powerful. I'm reading, uh, first of all, from 2 Samuel chapter 5. There are a couple of things that I don't mind telling you. I have been spending hours and hours of study. I can actually say that I've read this and studied it in my lifetime hundreds of hours, maybe even more than that, this uh, particular action of King David. You'll notice the scripture says, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, and they, uh, I believe we'll put that on the screen, beginning in about, in about verse 5, the Bible says, uh, I'll begin in verse 4, in verse 4, and David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, seven and a half years. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years. Over all of Israel and Judah, both of them combined. That's important to hear that. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites. Everyone say Jebusites. Jebusites. Who were the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, watch this. Except you take away the blind and the lame, you will not come in here. Thinking that David cannot come in there. Nevertheless... Somebody say, nevertheless. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. Today we call that Jerusalem. The city of David. And David said on that day, verse 8, on the day that they took that city, David said, whoever gets up to the gutter and smites the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, He shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, or because they said, the blind and the lame uh, shall not come into the house. I'll explain that in a moment. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord of hosts was with him. I think I'll just read the next verse to you. And Hiram, king of Tyre, those of you that At one time we're in the Masonic Lodge. Know exactly who that is. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. Let me read another verse to you, please. In 1 Samuel chapter 17. In 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's the story of David when he killed Goliath. And then I'll talk to you for a moment after I share this with you. And David uh, killed Goliath in verse 54. The Bible says, And David took the head of the Philistine, and he brought it to Jerusalem. Uh, But he put his armor in his tent. Uh, Look this way if you would please. That's an extremely interesting statement that gets overlooked so many times in the Bible. Uh, David, at that particular time, is somewhere around 15 or 16 years old. 15 years later, he will become the king of Israel and Judah united. And the scripture says when he killed Goliath that day, rarely do you hear people talk about the fact that he took the head and took it to what today is called Jerusalem. At that particular time, it was called the stronghold of the Jebusites or the city of the Jebusites. For uh, between three and four hundred years, what is today Jerusalem had been uh, conquered again 
after Joshua and the children of Israel had gone in and taken that land it, that God had promised to them, it had been reclaimed by the Canaanites. And the Canaanites had taken that. There was an offshoot of them that were there, a branch of them. And they took that particular area back. They fortified it so strong that for now almost 400 years, that city has been under the dominion of the Jebusites. The Jebusites were a branch of the Canaanites. There's very little in the Bible about them. But they were a warring uh, group that had protected that. So as the children of Israel had claimed the promised land, there were some areas that were kind of strongholds that stayed in there that they were continually having to take out. I don't want to get too deep in the history of it. But one of them was the city of the Jebusites, also today known as the city of David. Also uh, today it's referred to as Zion and definitely continually referred to as Jerusalem. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. You've got to get this picture with me just for a moment because vision can take some time, but vision can come to pass. God can drop something in your heart even when you were young, and that will come to pass. I know this sounds a little bit um, self-serving to be able to say this particular uh, thing, but when I was a young man, I was a teenager. My father had a big laundry and dry cleaner. And uh, one of the things he did, not only did he pastor a church, a small church that we grew up in, in a little small town, but he also worked continually. And so there were seven of us children, five of us boys, worked at that laundry and that dry cleaner often. And uh, the washeteria right next to it, we had a big washeteria that had about 100 machines in it. And so people would come, uh, this was back in the 60s, and they would come and they would uh, wash their clothes or they would dry them and, and, and first one thing and another. And this was a pretty large facility, so I would mop it and clean it on a daily basis, me and or my brothers would, wipe down all the machines, give people change when they needed it, et cetera, and just be there. When we got out of school and got out of ball practice, all summers long, and uh, the good thing is dad had five different boys and so he could rotate us through there. I would lock it up at night at 10 o'clock and drive to the house and, and things like that. Once again, in rotation with my brothers. Well, uh, one day I'm sitting in there, probably it was a Saturday. I'm sitting in the, uh, the washeteria and we had a television in there and I'm watching this TV. And I was probably at that time around 16 years old or something like that. And uh, we, we were right in the little town where we live and we had a pretty nice parking lot in front of it. And people would walk across the parking lot, go into the store, and do things of that nature. And there were these two young, cute girls that walked across the front of that, and they were both high school twirlers. I was captain of the football team. And so I'm sitting there. Y'all want to hear this story now, don't you? And I'm sitting there in, uh, in the laundry, and these two girls walk by. One of them kind of had dark hair and big uh, brown eyes, and the other one had red hair. They were best friends. And when they walked by, they didn't acknowledge me. They're just walking across the parking lot, and I'm doing whatever a red-blooded American boy would do. I'm looking at the girls. <laughs> One of them's name was Cindy Jolly. And she's walking by, and something happened on the inside of my heart that day. And I begin to, I, I barely even knew her. And I begin to like her. And I believe that day God dropped in my heart that one day I would marry her. Well, one day I married her. It was about six years later, but one day I married her. I believe God can begin vision for your life. Now, that doesn't have to happen to you. And please, just because you think a girl's good looking does not mean you're supposed to marry her. <laughs> but I have noticed that no guy ever marries a girl he doesn't think is really nice looking. Just uh, thought I'd throw that out there. And so I fell in love with her a couple of years later, and uh, I've never wanted to be with any other woman in my life except her. And so now this year, this month, we will have been married 43 years, our first 43. Let me just say to you, let me just say to you that God can put a, a dream or a desire in your heart that's for you personally, uh, but also it's going to be bigger than you. It's going to, that dream is going to be a lot bigger. David was about 15 or 16 years old. He is a shepherd boy. Uh, I believe I can prove from the scripture that he's disrespected by his family, by his father and by his brothers for sure, who were probably his half-brothers. 
He's very disrespected by them. He's obviously the most talented, skilled one of them all. Uh, yet, instead of being allowed to go and fight and be a warrior or even being uh, in the house like a normal son, he's out as a shepherd. His father, who obviously uh, was well known in the area, Jesse, had him out working another way and didn't even want to introduce him to Samuel when Samuel came looking to anoint one of the sons of uh, Jesse to become the next king. And Jesse had to particularly call for him to come forth. But regardless of what he had gone through, it did not stop David from serving Jehovah God. He's out as a shepherd boy. He's the person who knew how to give himself to something. And I believe God had put a dream or a desire or a vision on the inside of him that he would serve God. He got a revelation of God at an early age and would write the beautiful psalms that we have today. Many of them were written during that particular time when he was in his innocence and he's worshiping God and he's praising God. One time a bear and a lion came and tried to uh, steal or kill and destroy some of the sheep that he is watching. And he risked everything. When you read it, it appears he attacked them with his hands with his bare hands, and he tore them apart. Now, don't ask me how he did it. I just know what's in the Bible. Uh, the Scripture says he risked everything for a bunch of dumb sheep. Look at two people and say, I'm taking notes on that part right there. Come on. But something was on the inside of him. He had a dream and a desire. And I can see uh, uh, from the Scriptures there if you were uh, in Bethlehem, you're very close. You're not very far at all. You're just a few miles from where Jerusalem would be, uh, the city of the Jebusites. He would be out with those flocks. Maybe he's watching the sheep at night under uh, adverse conditions, probably uh, either hot or sometimes it could even be too cold, definitely dangerous. Uh, obviously, it's very dangerous. Uh, because of all of the uh, predators that would have been out there, the lions and much less the thieves that would be there. But something was inside of this young boy that even though he was not trained militarily, he was not an officer, he was not a warrior in that sense of the word, God must have dropped something in his spirit when he's out there maybe uh, during the day or the night and he's looking over at this place that for almost 400 years the children of Israel have been told that belongs to them. It used to belong to you. Now it's been taken back. The Jebusites have it and they mock you and there's no way. And this culture, it had kind of gone through the culture of Israel that just leave the Jebusites alone because you can't take that place. But David knew that according to Abraham's covenant and according to what Joshua had done initially, he knew that that particular thing belonged to the God of Israel. Amen. That it did not belong uh, to the Jebusites who obviously were not that way, but they were occupying it. Well, uh, the Bible uh, begins to uh, unfold it just a little bit. I'm not so sure, and you'll have to humor me with uh, this thought for a moment, but I believe that it was during that time that he was a shepherd boy. When he would see that, I believe that God began to put something in his heart that one day, David, one day you're going to be able to possess that uh, particular city that no one else for over three centuries has been able to uh, possess in Israel. It belongs to you. It's stolen inheritance. Someday you're going to get it back because God said it belonged to you. Can I just say that if God drops a dream, a vision, a ministry, a calling in your heart, it is without repentance. God has a plan, and sometimes it may not even be just for you. It may be the next one that's going to come behind you or the next one. But you should be doing your part, David, to help bring it forward. Joshua, do your part. Continue to do your part to bring it forward because one day there's going to come a time when even though the vision takes time, it will surely come to pass. You ought to take a break right there and give God the praise. Here David is, a young boy, a shepherd. The scripture says that the Jebusites would mock and they would intimidate and they would try to put down uh, the, the children of Israel. They would say, this is one city you'll never take. 
The Jebusites own this one. It's our stronghold. And even our blind, even our lame could defend this against you. And they did that, some historians say, mocking. They're mocking David and they're mocking the Jews. Uh, one of the reasons, the leaders, some of the main leaders, of course, of the Jewish covenant were people that had physical disabilities. If you remember Isaac, the older Isaac got, Isaac went blind and he could not see. And if you remember, he was deceived uh, uh, when uh, Jacob and, and his mother came in and and uh, instead of Esau getting the birthright because he was blind and they put a, a, a goat skin around uh, his arm, around Jacob's arm. And so when, when blind Isaac, there was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everybody say amen. amen. Follow with me now. And here he was blind and it looked like it reversed the covenant that should have been there because the birthright went to Jacob instead of going to Esau. And that was something that was a scandalous thing in that day. And now it had continued to go along. And if you remember the story of Jacob, Jacob was quite a rascal, but he was called by God. And he's out here doing his own thing in life. And finally he makes the decision, I better get right with God. And one night he wrestled with an angel. Does anybody remember that? He wrestled with the angel and, and he would not let him go until he was blessed. And finally that angel somehow uh, smote him on the hip and the Bible says it's like his hip came out of joint and it, and, it, and it crippled him in his hip. And the rest of his life he walked with a limp. He was lame. He walked with a limp. And so the Jebusites would, uh, would begin to mock. And, and they would mock the, the true and living God, Jehovah God. And they would mock those who were the leaders. And they would say, well, the blind and the lame up here can even do that because your, your ancestry and, and your faith and all of that's built on something as shallow as these crippled people. Can I just say that hell can try to laugh you uh, out of the vision, but it'll never laugh you into it. But one thing is for sure, if you will by faith make that decision to put your hand to the plow, regardless of what anyone says or circumstances which are always evolving in life, you keep your focus on the vision that God has for you it may take time but it will surely come to pass if you will not back off God loves vision and the Bible says that that David now he gets called to go and and in in 1 Samuel 17 there's a extremely interesting verse that gets overlooked so many times. 1 Samuel 17, verse 54. Uh, the scripture says that when David came, that he brought an offering. And David took the head uh, of the Philistine. This is 1 Samuel. Uh, verse 54, he says, he brought an offering. It's called the head. He took Goliath's head. Put that back up there. He took Goliath's head. And the scripture says... He brought that head to the city of the Jebusites, that place where not long before he would see it as a shepherd boy. He's out there and he's looking at that. He's probably heard plenty of times when the Jebusites who are holding that city, when they are mocking the things of God. What's important to understand about that, that city, right, that city where they had put a wall, right outside that wall is a place called Moriah. And in that particular city is also not only did Moses offer to God there, but also Abraham took his son Isaac there, and there he offered unto the Lord. Historians, and I believe this, Bible historians, say that same place, uh, uh, the city of the Jebusites, which is Jerusalem, I believe, was where the Garden of Eden was. Many people believe that on that same hill right there that's also called Golgotha, is where also the tree of life was. Uh, I'm of the opinion, I actually believe that that's where the center of that garden was that went 1,500 square miles according to the land markers that are given in the book of Genesis where are the north, south, east, and west boundaries. The Bible talks about the headwaters of those four rivers being there. And so I still believe that today. If you do not believe that, that's fine. You have the right to be wrong. And... Uh, uh, and so there you have this place. So in this particular place, it's very sacred to the Jews because the father of faith, Abraham, had offered Isaac in that same area. That's where Moses had offered unto the Lord right there. 
That's where the tree of life was. And listen, according to historians, uh, Jewish historians as well as the early church historians, that's where Adam was buried, where Adam, especially his skull, uh, most uh, historians that study uh, uh, old church history know, and you can see all of this, of course, the Greek, or uh, Greek Orthodox Church is very good at capturing that. Uh, uh, early church history or old world history, not only do they do that, and I've read in, in numerous uh, particular uh, historical records of this, but also uh, in Jerusalem itself, there is a place called uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and in it, uh, one of the places that are there is called uh, in the uh, Basilica or in the, the Room of Adam, basically, and that's uh, uh, the Sepulchre of Adam. They believe that that's where Adam was buried. The Jewish historians believed that uh, Melchizedek had a lot to do with that because Japheth, one of, one of the sons of Noah, had taken the bones of Adam before the flood and had secured them, and then Melchizedek was used by God to oversee that because he, listen, this is very important, stay with me, and according to church history, uh, there, uh, uh, Adam was ultimately buried at that same site. It was a very powerful, precious thing. It's not just a political thing you hear about today. Jesus is coming back to that place. He started the whole thing here on earth at that place. Can I have a better amen? And hell has tried to sidetrack that ever since the Garden of Eden. It's something that pulls at the very heartstring and the soul of all of humanity, and they do not even know why it's an issue. And the Bible says that David that day, he's not a warrior. We have no idea that he knows even how to use a sword other than he says, I've never tried or proven any of Saul's armor. The Scripture says that he goes out that day and, he, and, and Goliath, who is a type of Satan, Goliath is a type of the devil. Amen. The scripture says that David kills him, and for some reason, instead of just knocking him down and killing him, he takes his sword, he takes Goliath's own sword and cuts his head off. And then the scripture says that he takes that head shortly thereafter, he shows it to Saul, and then apparently chronologically, he takes that and he goes those few miles over there and he takes that head and according to one historian, he put it on a pole and he stuck it in the ground outside the wall of where the Jebusites were, their hated enemy, and it's like he was making a token unto God and he's saying, what I have done right here, I know I'm just a boy, but hang on, one day I'm going to do the same thing to you because this belongs to Jehovah God. And God had put something in his heart when he was just a youngster. And when it was time, he stepped into that role, not as a boy, but he stepped into it as a man and a man of God. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you in your daily walk with Christ.